Right. Right, let's get to that island then. I can see an animal. Where? This is three. I can see something flying low. I, bet I reckon it's like a coot or something. And two, one. Look up! Oh, wow. It's going over there. Oh, it's just going over me. It's Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm just going to give you all. Oops. One moment. Playing again. Just going to give everyone just another minute to come in and then we will get started. All right, it's 6.30, we will get started. Welcome. Um, we have a wonderful turnout for tonight, which I'm really excited about. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoy the video we just played um, and I can certainly share the link if anyone is interested. Um, and for all the bird enthusiasts, I just had to add this. You may already know that there was a rare snowy owl sighting in the city um, and Randall's Island um, had the privilege of hosting the first greater white fronted goose seen in New York City, not, not only a couple weeks ago. So thank you all to also who joined us two weeks ago when Elizabeth spoke with Chris Gergenti, our natural areas manager, and who gave us a glimpse into the park's rich and varied wildlife and natural areas. Tonight, Elizabeth Howard, um, Randall Island Park Alliance's writer in residence and volunteer who has been the visionary behind our new literary club programming, journalist and author in her own right, will bring you all back to the island and Helen McDonald's book with the help of our distinguished guest, Andrew Farnsworth. Dr. Farnsworth is a senior research associate in the Center for Aryan Pop um, Population Studies at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. He's been a lifelong birder and his current research focuses on the use and application of rapidly advancing technology to study bird movements um, using surveillance radar, audio video recordings, monitoring tools, citizen science and, and databases and machine learning. Andrew's expertise and guidance comes, in, um, comes to light in Ms. McDonald's essay entitled High Rise. Here to talk about Vesper flights, I welcome Elizabeth and Andrew, thank you.
Um, thank you, Nikki. And I might mention that I know I noticed somebody already in chat has asked for um, how, how to get to this a YouTube link. And actually, the reason that we selected that video is that it is one of the chapters in the book. And um, it's words to accompany Sarah Wood's 2015 film, Murmuration Times 10. So we may be talking about that in one of our next sessions. So that was just kind of a little teaser. Um, thank you for all of you who've joined us this evening. And this is our second in the inaugural literary program on, on Randall's Island. Helen MacDonald reminds us in her writing that the planet is beautifully and insistently not human, and we must learn to exist together. So that's what we thought about in putting this literary program together, that we would incorporate literature, science, and nature. And as Nikki mentioned, uh, Vesper Flights is, is a series of essays, although um, how it, they are, uh, Helen McDonald's writing is very much connected. So you can think of them as either essays or chapters. And so what we're going to look at this evening is High Rise. And this was um, when she met Andrew Farmsworth on the deck of the Empire State Building so that they could watch the spring migration. So Andrew, thank you for being with us and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, Helen McDonald is in London in a city that's very locked down and it's almost midnight there. However, she did send us a message and I wanted to share it with everyone. That's really awful. Mine isn't working either. What happened? Yeah, what it's not, it's not, um, Nikki, it's not playing. It's not playing. We've, we've missed the whole thing. But we're gonna play it again. This is, what's her name? Uh, the author. The it's, Helen McDonald, it's wonderful. Um, well, I, I couldn't hear any of it. Okay. Nikki? Nikki, you're muted. That might be the situation. Yeah. Hold on, I'm going to back up. Let's start again. Good. Start at the beginning. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Helen McDonald, and um, I wrote Vespa Flights, and I'm really thrilled to hear that you're reading it um, as part of the Randall Islands Literary Program. I'm really sorry I can't be with you properly virtually, um, but I wanted to say hi to everybody and talk a little bit about my um, the uh, amazing evening I spent with Andrew Farnsworth um, on the Empire State Building on a very beautiful May evening watching migrating birds. Um, in fact, I went up the day before as a kind of you know reconnaissance trip, and it was really funny. It was incredibly foggy that night. And I was the I, I got to the top really quickly because you know most sensible people decided that there was no reason to go up the tower at all, the building at all. So I got to the top and there was um, the the building was lit up uh, with purple light that evening. So and the, the fog was everywhere. It's like being in a Prince video. And all the the security people and the were, were all laughing at me. They were like, "What are you doing here? You can't see anything." So. And then the next night, as you know, if you've um, read that ch chapter, I, I went up and um, not really knowing what to expect. And it was this incredible heavy migration night. And it was lovely to meet Andrew. And um, this night really transformed not only how I thought about tall buildings, um, but about the air itself. You know, I'd always assumed the air was this empty, vacant place. And I had no idea how much life 
was teeming within it. And um, so we, you know, we 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 stood there for, for quite a long time, you know, watching these, you know, birds coming over this, you know, the, these birds, these frail creatures pulled north by their magnetic compasses and their will. And um, it was unbearably moving, you know, watching them. I, I say in the piece, it was a little bit like like a slow tracer fire or stars, you know, they were being uplit from below by by the lights. And uh, it was it was really very, very astonishing. And as Andrew people say, you know, using um, radar maps to to see these sort of blooming sort of uh, thick kind of clouds of biology moving through the air. Um, it was amazing. And I, you know, the next day, I, I think I went for a walk or the day after that, I think went for a walk in Central Park and I saw all these, these warblers that had come to earth uh, messing around in, 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 in the trees and bushes. And um, they became different things to me. Now I, I, I had this sort of knowledge of, of, of this sort of nocturne of, of, sort of ice crystals and, and, and clouds that they were, were going through. And, and I think that night more than anything else, you know, I love New York. It's one of my favorite places on earth. And uh, the night up on the Empire State Building, watching that migration changed how I felt about the city. Um, it became connected to the other places that these birds had come from and where they were going to. And it seemed to me that, you know, um, we live in a world where connecting with nature is, is often very hard, particularly if you live in an urban environment. And the, the thought that unseen over our heads, you know, twice a year, there are these enormous movements of, 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 of birds was, you know, a life-changing realization really that you know even if we can't see it it's there the plenitude of, of life it's threatened but it's still there and um i really hope that um some of you might get to experience that you know if you could maybe get up into a tall building at some point in the spring migration or in the fall migration when there are even more birds because there are all the young ones too um and experience some of that sublimity for yourself I'm, I'm very sorry that I can't be there, as I say, with you all. And I'm sorry not to be able to hang out with Andrew as well, who's a great person. And I really hope you have a, a lovely a lovely time today. So um, thank you very much again. And I hope that I might meet some of you in person in the future. Take care. So, um, Nikki, I can't see Andrew. Can He's there. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> um, the paperback edition of Vesper Flights is coming out uh, in July. And, and I'm hoping that possibly if Helen McDonald happens to be in New York, uh, Andrew, we can entice both of you out to Randall's Island so that we can have we can have a program there. Um, imagine a nice day sitting in the park. We've all been vaccinated, um, you know, just <laughs> a thought to kind of keep in mind. Um, Andrew, as we get started, perhaps you, I know there are people on this call who haven't been to Randall's Island, and I thought you could just take a moment and give them a sense of place. Absolutely. Um, first, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight and for having me. And wow, for what a, I mean, I'll have to thank Helen. Uh, what, a, what an amazing introduction. Um, Rand, let's uh, shift gears to Randall's. Um, so, I've been fortunate to be a, a city resident more or less officially you know, for the last 20 years. I grew up near New York City in Rye. Um, I grew up in a place that had a salt marsh literally down the street from me. So I've always loved, um, I've always loved Spartina and, um, you know, the flow of water in and out of it and, and birding in salt marshes. So living in Manhattan and finding a place where there was a salt marsh um, when I first arrived here, it was sort of like a gold mine. And from a birding perspective, um, finding a place like that in a sea of, you know, asphalt and other built environment was just like this incredible little diamond in the rough. Um, and over the course of the last, you know, 15 or 20 years, when I've been fortunate enough to not spend a ton of time, nowhere near what I would like, but certainly to spend some up at Randall's Island. I often find myself going, if I have a free moment to go birding, I will go there. And usually I'll go to the Northeast shoreline. There's a 
there's an area of ball fields um, and uh, that's that's ringed by large boulders and then um, the the body of water between LaGuardia and the Brothers Islands and Rikers Island and this little patch of salt marsh that's growing off uh, ball field 42 between literally the, the interface between technically New York County and, and the Bronx between Manhattan and the Bronx and every uh, late September Early October, there are saltmarsh sparrows in there. There are Nelson sparrow species you would not ever think to find in Manhattan. Um, it's just a wonderful little gem. That's just a tiny part of it. Uh, so I, I, I've had such an amazing time up there. I would like to go there every moment <laughs> of the day and build up a tremendous list and monitor migration from there and everything. Um, it's, uh, it's just such a unique spot to be one so close to the water in Manhattan and not be swarmed with people to be amongst this incredible diversity of habitat, including some that really aren't anywhere else on the island. Sure, if you go out to Long Island or if you go north along the coast uh, to Westchester and Connecticut, you encounter some of these things, but actually in Manhattan, it's just such a cool and unique experience. Um, I am just so glad that it's part of the city lifestyle and part of the city's fabric. So, um, Andrew, before we start talking about being on, on the top of the Empire State Building, Helen McDonald is such a poetic writer. I thought I'd read a little bit, uh, read a few of her words. Skyscrapers are at their most perfect at night, full-fledged dreams of modernity that erase nature and replace it with a new landscape rot of artifice, our cartography of, of glass, of steel and glass and light. But people live in them for the same reason that they travel to wild places to escape the city. The highest buildings raise you above the mess and chaos of light, life at, at street level. They also raise you into something else. The sky may seem like an empty place, just as we once thought the deep ocean to be a lifeless void. But like the ocean, this is a vast habitat full of life. Bats and birds, flying insects, spiders, windblown seeds, microbes, drifting spores. The more I stare at the city across miles of dusty, uplit air, the more I begin to think of these super tall buildings as machines that work like deep sea submersibles transporting us to inaccessible realms we cannot otherwise explore. Inside them, the air is calm and clean and temperate. Outside is a tumultuous world teeming with unexpected biological abundance, and we are standing in its midst. Now, Helen writes when she, she said, I knew immediately when I got to the top of the Empire State Building, I could identify Andrew because he was standing there with these very sophisticated binoculars hanging around his neck and he was staring up at the sky. So we, we know what she thought. So perhaps you can tell us, give us your perspective on meeting Helen. I have to say when I, um, I was, I was distracted when I first met Helen, I was looking up at a black crown night heron that was, that was passing over us. Um, and, and she came up and I, you know, I, I did not know what to expect. Um, having read, Having read her work, uh, H is for Hawk, before meeting her, um, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily know how to get a sense of someone from their writing, although it turns out you can get a pretty good picture. What a thoughtful and um, incredibly, um, incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly interested person from instant one, um, the connection was just very calm and real and um, and deep. It was uh, it was I think one of the most amazing things. Um, Ellen has this background uh, because of her family and also because of her her interest that uh, very quickly got her into the mindset of you know well how do you think about what's happening in the air Wh whether she understood at that point what she later wrote in that beautiful passage 
uh, she very clearly was on the page of like, wow, this is this is like a new frontier up here, and and I'm experiencing it, and it's it's amazing. But I know it's amazing, and I know that it, we're going to be studying it and talking about it. She knew exactly how to, you know, sort of how to get comfortable immediately. Um, so, I mean, I I I can't say that that moment was anything other than like oh, it's nice to meet you. Let's do this now because there's a lot of cool stuff about to happen or happening already. <laughs> well, she writes about, so she, you know, wanted to talk to you about the Atlantic Flyway and perhaps you can explain to those. So I have, Andrew, I think I, I told you that I did go on a spring migration trip with Eric Masterson. Mm -hmm. And Eric Masterson has written a book on bird, bird watching in New Hampshire and actually rode his bicycle from Hancock, New Hampshire to Central America to follow a migration. And I, I spent a weekend with him on Star Island and it, there was a terrible storm the night we were supposed to go. And, and so we, we had to cancel and go early the next morning, which meant that the birds had also could not leave overnight. So we had this, you know, amazing day of watching, you know, being with these birds. And then that night, you know, the next morning they, they have all that are all left. But, but in part of that, I learned about, you know, perhaps there are people on this phone who on this call who are the, in our program who don't know about, you know, sort of how the how the migration works. And perhaps you can describe some of that. Sure, and I do see a lot of a lot of old friends on the call too, which is really really wonderful. Um, people that I've met for many 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 years at this point. Um, so yes, about about migration and about the ways we we describe it. So, for those of you that that don't know, um, one of the ways uh, very early in the 20th century that uh, scientists and and hunters and conservationists. Um, and, and the general public started thinking about the movements of birds were as these highways, these thoroughfares, these corridors um, where one could find the passage at the appropriate time of the year of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds. Flyways was the term for them. Of course, when the term came out, it was long before there were any highways or cars, anything like that. So it really was a concept that uh, embodied that there were large numbers of birds in a very specific area. And it happened at a very specific time of the year. And it so happened that it was mostly driven, the definition, by waterfowl. So migrating geese, migrating ducks, and that that was the concept that really um, defined where these birds traveled when they were traveling, that linked where they spent the summer and where they spent the winter. And very broadly, originally, there were three to four flyways, an Atlantic, a Central, a Pacific, and then sort of this blurry kind of, um, there was a Mississippi that kind of merged with the Central, kind of was in between Central and Eastern. And gradually that notion of flyways and these corridors expanded to include not just waterfowl, um, uh, but really all birds. And um, it wasn't until really probably the, the late 1950s or 1960s with the advent of the first weather surveillance radar network in the United States, the WSR 57, that there became a much, much broader understanding that, well, flyways work well to characterize some species like waterfowl, for example, but the movements of other birds are much, much broader in nature. In fact, it's not really like a flyway. It's much more like a ocean of birds moving. Yes, there are defining features where birds get concentrated, but um, over much of the Eastern US from the Rockies, certainly to the Atlantic Ocean, um, the broad scale movement of birds was a dominating feature of migration and uh, much, much broader scale than the flyway corridor concept. So even though the flyway concept persists, and it is a useful way of thinking about birds that move through a particular part of the country, say, uh, to the primarily to the east of the Appalachians in the fall, 
um, or in the spring migrate between, uh, say, the Mississippi River and uh, the Rockies and move north there. That it's broadly useful to think about um, geographic regions where birds are passing. Many of the birds know no boundaries and they're using the airspace the way they know best. Um, they take advantage of wind or favorable conditions or marginal conditions at some point. They avoid unfavorable conditions. And there are, uh, even though some bounds to where they go, it is much, much broader than just the concept of the corridor of a flyway. So it's kind of this interesting, interesting concept. You tell some migration researchers, um, that uh, you're interested in studying flyways and they'll sort of scoff and say, no, 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 that's not how it works at all. Um, and you'll speak to others and they'll say, yes, of course, this is a good way of breaking down that there's a certain group of species that moves to one part of the country, a certain that moves through another. So of course, somewhere in between and blending a little bit is kind of the reality of what's happening. So the national weather system now is, it tracks closely all the migrations, right? And can, it can't, the, an individual could go look at their sites and learn about the migration and, and when it's happening? Very, it's very cool. Um, so I, some time ago, I met a, um, an ornithologist who said, you know, the, the radar that the National Weather Service uses really should not be called the weather surveillance radar, but should be called an animal surveillance radar, because most of what these radars detect uh, is biological in nature and not meteorological necessarily. The patterns that we often see, if if Weather Channel or your local news outlet, not to exclude the biology and leave only the meteorology, you would see a tremendous amount of of, of patterns that didn't correspond to rain or snow or hail or grapple or whatever kind of meteorological phenomena are up there. Um, so even though with the current network, you can't see an individual bird, you can see large numbers of birds. And, and what we've done in the past few years um, has really been to try to use this network as a tool to quantify migration, to look over a 25 year period um, where we can take the biological information that these weather radars detect, remove the, the, the meteorology, and really try to talk about only, well, how many birds are moving, when are they moving, where are they moving, and do our best to try to calculate what those numbers look like and how they've changed over time. So the power of radar, um, it's, this wasn't our discovery. Radar actually, um, and, and Helen talks about this quite, quite a bit in various different uh, phases of her, her uh, books actually, um, and has direct connection to uh, the radar technology and in a family member, father, um, who, who was active uh, and wa watching radar. The technology and the capability of this technology to uh, capture information about birds Date, predates World War II. Um, it was really the thing that that confounded the people that were operating it when they first turned them on to say, wait a minute, like this is not a plane that we're seeing on radar. This is not a storm. When we look out there, we don't see anything except a murmuration of starlings and thus was born, you know, radar ornithology. Fast forward uh, 70 or 80 years and uh, to where we are now, the weather surveillance radar that we're using in the US and the 150 or so of them uh, do a wonderful job of surveying the atmosphere and telling us a tremendous amount about bird migration. And uh, the BirdCast project that I work on um, has, uh, has really spent its existence for some part of the last 20 years trying to figure out how to crack the nut of taking that information out of the meteorological framework and into the biological framework. Yeah, well, what and what effect uh, can you describe of climate change on all of this? I mean, it must be tremendous, Andrew. Yeah, well, um, you think about migration in the first place and the fact that um, birds are, are moving at times tremendous distances from one place to another. And, and you think about why it evolved in the first place um, and how it evolved in the first place and climate change albeit climate change from the perspective of evolutionary time, not human-induced uh, climate change time over much, much shorter scales, 
of revolutionary time, the whole notion of, of uh, changing environments, uh, the, the uh, changes in temperature that allow organisms to explore different environments, to reproduce in those environments en masse, and then return to the places from which they came, and to have those kinds of patterns develop over time because some organisms are more successful than others at exploiting particular areas. Climate change is an integral part of, of the reason that migration exists. Now, when we talk about climate change in the current sense of the, the term um, and the speed with which it's happening as a result of human activities, yes, birds are either responding to it uh, positively or negatively. Uh, Birds that are more flexible, generally speaking, may be able to adapt, if, especially if they have big populations. Birds that are already occupying very particular niches that have small populations may have tremendous challenges. So the notion of these rapid kinds of climate changes occurring and the potential to alter population structures dramatically because of the, word, the way birds behave in particular places in particular times, do they arrive to an area after, you know, some, some uh, long evolutionary history of occurring, say, arriving to a boreal forest in the end of May or beginning of June, only to find that this massive pulse of insects that they formerly exploited happened two weeks earlier because of climate change. These are the kinds of things that we're starting to see and explore. So even though migration is very flexible and all of the different pieces that that make for a bird to be able to migrate and for species to um, to exhibit those kinds of characteristics, uh, that very feature can be extremely damning when it comes to these kinds of rapid changes and whether or not they can respond to them. Um, Helen writes in the book, of course, about the uh, World Trade Center Memorial, uh, the, the memorial tribute that's around September 11th every year and, you know, shine the, the lights up into the sky. They go five miles into the sky and can be seen, what, 60 miles from the city, but cause tremendous problems for the birds. Perhaps you can, uh, you know, describe what, what that's doing to their, to some of their patterns and their health. Yeah, light, light pollution is a serious issue. Maybe many of you know about it from, from various different perspectives. Um, so um, when we think about other ways that, that humans impact their environment, um, since what, say the late 19th century, maybe, maybe Chicago World's Fair time, you know, the 18, 1890s um, was I think the first fully electric uh, World's Fair. Um, illuminating, you know, the night. Uh, since then, light has expanded um, and, and light pollution at just this incredible rate. And that's really over the last 120 or 130 years, nocturnal organisms or, or at least organisms that are, that are active at night um, face an incredible challenge because light is a, an incredibly powerful stimulus in terms of attraction, very much uh, an ancestral kind of a characteristic, literally to single-celled organisms, uh, showing phototaxis or attraction or uh, either attraction or repulsion from light. Um, so there's that factor. It also happens to dis disorient birds that are migrating at night um, for a number of interesting reasons that we can, we can maybe get into at some point that really basically it affects their sensory capabilities and um, it uh, pretty much short circuits their, their abilities to use uh, uh, magnetic cues, visual cues, acoustic cues, other celestial cues. It is just a very powerful source of information for them. So when you put any kind of light into a nocturnal environment, the attractive and disorienting factors are immediately apparent. Um, we've seen it uh, in, in its most extreme form uh, at the Tribute and Light, uh, the September 11th Memorial, extremely bright beams um, that at times attract, you know, tens of thousands of birds. Um, but, but there's an amazing positive story there. It's quite a long one, but the short of it is that the producers and the organizers 
and all the stakeholders that, that produced that uh, incredible memorial um, and the somber and, and, and emotional memorial have been incredibly supportive, uh, in particular for the last decade or so, of turning off the lights when they see large numbers of birds behaving in certain ways uh, in the beams. So even though the memorial, of course, has nothing at all to do with science or with birds, um, they have been so uh, careful to say, you know, we really, we don't want to see uh, any other loss of life at this site or any other experience that may make people think about that. So if there are large numbers of birds behaving in certain ways, we will turn off the lights for 20 minutes. And we've been fortunate enough um, to, to study what happens down there. And when those lights go off, all of those attracted and disoriented birds, they disperse. Well, and Helen writes about the, the birds that don't survive in, in the city. What was the number? I think it was over 100,000 birds or something that each year that, that yeah. you know, with, with the windows and the reflections and everything else. So, you know, she writes about that one bird on the, when you were in the Empire State Building that, you know, you saw this little bird and then, and then he came back and you realized that he was circling. He, you know, was completely. You know, That's exactly the situation is that, they, that one of the, one of the common features, if if uh, any of you ever get to go up to the Empire State Building, or if at some point when the world reopens again, we all get to go up there, which would be wonderful. And I certainly will invite everybody to do that when there's an appropriate time to do it. Um, one of the common features that you see when there is uh, heavy migration uh, on a particular night and the Empire State Building is illuminated um, is that you do see birds circling as Helen describes. So they, they are attracted to the light, they are disoriented by it, and they may circle around it. And, and one of the features that um, is also very clear is that the more birds that get attracted to it, suddenly it becomes even more and more of a magnet. And part of it is, is um, you know, uh, that these birds are vocalizing when they're disoriented and that's calling in other individuals. And so there's this feedback pattern that happens. Um, it so happens at the Tribute and Light, we can short circuit that by turning it off. The Empire State Building, the short circuiting is a little bit longer term in that it shuts off at about 2 a.m. And after that point, thankfully, everything usually disperses. So Helen talks in her book about, uh, in, the, in the chapter about um, walking in the ramble in Central Park the next day, because of course, when the migration is going on, and the birds travel at night because you know the temperature it's it's a little safe for them and then they rest during the day um you know when they're coming so where would they i mean if they're coming they're stopping in manhattan or new york then where where how long would it where would they probably have come from and that's then, a really, really good question so we know a little bit about that um and uh it it varies a lot by species but let's say you go you go birding in central park in may and you happen to encounter some some wonderful morning when there are 10 or 15 or 20 species of warblers uh in the ramble um, many of those birds uh we think are especially when it's central park and when it's spring on southwesterly winds that blow from the southwest and, and birds sort of get pushed to the coast. We think of those birds as coming from uh, points in the mid-Atlantic or maybe a little bit farther away. Most of those birds, most of the small songbirds like that, uh, based on the best estimates we have and the, the data that we're starting to gather, looks like it's on the order of a few hundred miles away uh, for a lot of the birds that arrive there. Now that's the smallest birds. Some of the larger birds that are there, um, uh, every so often you might encounter um, various water birds like a green heron around Turtle Pond or a great egret or something like that. Some of those birds, it looks like, migrate from quite a lot farther away in a single shot. Some of the great egrets may in fact be coming straight from the Caribbean when they arrive. They may be flying totally over water from uh, Cuba or uh, other parts uh, a little farther, farther east and south in the Antilles and will go directly uh, to, to you know, Long Island, New York, uh, Northeastern North America. So it really varies by species. But, but those small birds that she was talking about, the warblers and, and other songbirds, they're migrating a few hundred miles per night usually when they're in that region of the US. 
That said, when they're crossing other places, for example, the Gulf of Mexico uh, or the Caribbean Sea, some of these small songbirds are making these absolutely incredible flights. Um, some of them have been tracked, and so we now have good quantitative evidence to show that birds leave the northern coast of South America from Colombia and occasionally will fly straight until they land in Illinois. So okay. uh, you're talking about a robin sized bird doing that. Um, it may not be all the time, but it happens a lot more regular than really than we thought uh, or than we ever imagined. So the distances and, and the connectivity she's talking about, the, the idea of thinking like, oh, this, this you know, ocean of organisms um, that connects to the mid-Atlantic and the southeastern US and maybe directly to the Caribbean and even farther, you know, directly to Central and South America. It's really incredible. Now, Andrew, since May, in May this year, a lot of New York was shut down. We didn't have the lights on Broadway. I mean, a lot of the lights weren't quite probably as bright as they normally are. Did you see a difference in, in, in any of the migrating patterns? That is an exceptionally good question. And <laughs> I, I hope to have an answer for that soon. We've started to explore that because we have all of these, these data available to us now from radar and also uh, birders and citizen scientists out there reporting their observations. Right now, um, it doesn't look like there were tremendously different movements relative to just the typical variation we might see from year to year. The numbers do not look larger uh, in the spring per se relative to other years. But that said, um, clearly there were some species involved um, and species that appeared that we don't usually see. And certainly there also were concentrations of birds in the city in particular, um, in many areas because of so few people um, and also so little light that were uh, quite a bit different from what we normally experience. So my sense is that the pattern's gonna be a bit complex to extract, but that we are gonna see some differences in uh, migration behaviors, but not so much per se in the total numbers uh, in, the, in the spring anyway. When it comes around to fall and looking there, eh, things might change a little bit. It, it does not seem, um, based on some of the satellite data we've looked at, say where humans spent most of the time uh, in the greater New York area, you see this incredible exodus of people based on their illumination at night, their use of, of, you know, of lights where they're spending time at home. Um, there was a mass exodus, as we all know, from the city. So the bright, bright, bright areas of the city that we're so used to from satellite data for the past decade suddenly were oriented in different places in the suburbs. My suspicion is that you're going to see different concentrations of birds aloft in those places when we look at the radar data attracted to the light, but that it's going to be a muted effect, I think. So thankfully, um, you know, I don't think there was anything adverse that occurred. I wish that there was something more beneficial that may have occurred. Well, I, I, you know, I was thinking, I, I walked around the reservoir in Central Park today and, and just thinking about this evening's conversation and noticing all those tall spires that just keep, you know, cropping up. Do you work with architects? Are architects, con or is the architectural community concer uh, concerned at all about lighting and glass? And because they certainly are building a lot of tall buildings. That's a great question too. There are, there are an increasing number of architects that are both concerned and very serious about bird friendly building design. Um, there has been a really uh, wonderful renaissance of that kind of scientific thinking and uh, really solid conservation thinking in New York City in particular with the bird friendly design bill and, and passing that. Uh, New York City Audubon has been a wonderful advocate, among other groups, for really making that happen in the city and uh, making it a reality that I think is, uh, is absolutely a great model for other large metropolitan areas, it's not, just, not just cities, but any place where there's glass. So yes, architects are taking notice, no question. Um, and there's been some great science between uh, sort of backing up 
what kinds of labs treatments one could create, how to embed different patterns or uh, alter the, uh, the passage of light through glass to make it uh, more visible to birds. And that in conjunction with changing the way we illuminate at night, that, that really gets at both uh, really two features of what happens when it comes to bird collisions. Part of it has to do with birds being attracted to these areas of hazards with lights at night. So they get drawn in, maybe some collide at night, maybe some just get drawn into New York City or large metropolitan areas and then collide the next morning because of the issues with glass and not being able to perceive. So it's a two, really a two pronged problem that, that no question architects are buy, starting to buy into. I don't think unfortunately it's, um, it's quite to the level that we would like it to be in terms of every single building buying into it or retroactively uh, treating their windows or retroactively fitting their windows. But I don't think it's going to be long before we start to see some really big changes with some of the new buildings that are coming up because some of them do have this technology and are very, very serious about it and very vocal about it. Um, and I think also there's a great push um, because, of course, when you start to think about energy efficiency uh, possible with altering your lighting schemes, as well as changing the way uh, you uh, design and implement your windows, suddenly there's a, an additional bottom line benefit. Those things are starting to get wrapped up now in a really positive way that hopefully will be good feedback so that even more people will buy into the, the logic. Now, when you know we talk about um, the spring migration in May and the uh, fall mig mig migration in October, but uh, again, Andrew, how does a person who isn't really in the birding community understand how how to find the right you know is there you know the right day or the right time to to actually the best time to to watch? Well, you can always you can always call me up. I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> I think that's a little dangerous. I think you might. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have offered that, but I'm happy. But but. I'd love to put something together with you. I'm, absolutely. Yes, but there there are a few. There are a couple of different ways to think about this. Um, one, um, a very easy way is that one of the aspects of the Birdcast project uh, that we are most uh, proud of of sort of promoting is that we're making forecasts now for the U.S of where and when birds will migrate. So the birdcast.info website in spring and fall migration periods is posting these, these maps uh, that update every six hours um, that show where the intense migration uh, is forecast to occur. And then also a, an observed map, a, a live map, if you will, of what's happening when birds are migrating. So at the very least, you can go to that website and look at what's forecast for your particular area. We're also starting to make um, make tailored alerts for particular cities that will send you a message when there's a high intensity migration uh, event slated for your area. So that's coming soon too. We're, we're sort of piloting that in, in Texas as part of a major campaign to try to turn lights out in Dallas and Houston and other areas. So um, uh, an alert that says, oh, there's high intensity bird migration coming and up, oh, it's a good time to turn off your lights. So that's, that's on the one hand, there's a, a way to look for yourself at a website that will kind of synthesize that information in a very simple kind of very much like a weather map kind of a graphic that, that we think is beautiful, but is very simple in terms of conveying the message of high intensity here, not so much here, go birding in this place, you know, maybe not so much here. Um, even even more broadly, if you want to disconnect from the computer and not have to look at anything like that, you can, you literally can watch the weather. So in the spring, um, there's a very strong correlation between uh, the arrival of large numbers of birds and southerly winds, the approach of a cold front. So increasing temperatures, southerly winds, increasing humidity in April and May, is very much associated with the arrival of birds because of these favorable conditions for birds to fly tailwinds, birds blowing out of the south in advance of a, of a cold air mass arriving, right? So 
if you happen to look at the weather and see that there's going to be a dramatic change in temperature coming in February or March or April or May, chances are very good that there will be an intense migration event that's associated with it. And in the fall, when you have dramatic temperature drops and intense northerly or westerly winds, uh, that's another good time to go out. Really, when you see these dramatic changes in those periods, at the very least, it's a time you should be watching to think about birds on the move. So that's a way to do it that just is simply looking at the sky and perceiving, oh, it's a lot warmer today than it was yesterday, uh, or a lot colder today. Uh, it's a good way to gauge what's happening that has nothing to do at all with having to deal with, you know, your phone or a computer or anything like that, just simply being outside and being observant. Andrew, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what the Cornell Ornithology Lab does and how you work, you must work internationally. I mean, how are, you know, all of this needs to be certainly with South America and Africa and, you know, where these birds are coming from. We have a broad, uh, 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 we cast a broad net. Um, most of the work that I've been doing recently has been in the Western Hemisphere and trying to, to understand the, the connectivity between um, what happens and birds that breed in, in the boreal forests and in the temperate forests of, and, and um, all the different habitats of, of North America and how that connectivity um, uh, to South America works, sort of what the, the drivers are, how it's changing, uh, how we survey it. I have other colleagues that work on, on similar systems in Europe for the, the European migra the, the Eurasian migration system is so incredible and, and complex. In, in the US it's complex or in, in the Western hemisphere, it's complex enough with these different, you know, these different sort of regional zones, like I was saying earlier, flyways or regions where birds are moving. In Eurasia, the complexity of birds moving from Europe to West Africa and Europe to South and East Africa and Asia to India, Asia to Africa and Asia to Australia, there's just these incredible threads of connectivity that are there and we do have people working there as well. If there's one thing that, that's really clear about, um, about studying migrating animals, it's that if you want to go to lots of cool places <laughs> and you want to experience uh, a diversity of, of the world and a diversity of habitats and, and think about life on the move, there's no better system than, than migrating animals. And birds are just, you know, they're one of a, a range of animals that migrate, obviously. They happen to be ubiquitous. They're easy for us to see for the most part. They sound nice. They look pretty. They're, they're pretty much uh, uh, something that catches our eye quickly. But there are plenty of other organisms that migrate as well in, in orders of magnitude more uh, mass, just incredible. Uh, dragonflies, butterflies, uh, small micro insects. Uh, I have some colleagues, um, one, uh, one in, in the UK um, who has been studying uh, tiny insects moving uh, over uh, Europe and uh, hoverflies and, and other incredibly numer numerous insects that may order on the trillions when they pass through particular areas. Just these incredible, like almost unfathomable numbers of, of animals aloft. We have, you know, if anyone would like to put some questions in the chat, we have a few minutes. Yeah. I would like, I would just like to read um, the last paragraph in a uh, high rise. Living in a high rise building bars you from certain ways of interacting with the natural world. You can't put out feeders to watch robins and chickpeas in your garden, but you are set in another part of their habitual world, a nocturne of ice crystals and cloud and wind and darkness. High rise buildings, symbols of mastery over nature can work as bridges towards a more complete understanding of the natural world, stitching the sky to the ground, nature to the city. For days afterwards, my dreams are full of songbirds, the familiar ones from woods and backyards, but also points of moving light, little astronauts traveling, using the stars to navigate, having fallen to earth for a little while before picking themselves up and moving on. She writes so beautifully. Um, 
Amazing. Absolutely. Take a few, we have a few questions. Um, and thank you, Andrew and Elizabeth, very much for asking me to say that. Um, these two questions I might actually be related, so I'm going to put them together. One, um, the first part of it is, what type of birds did we see in the New York area or in other places that didn't you haven't seen before um, that was different this year? And along with that is a friend that's it's tuning in from South Florida, and she said that the number of birds that have migrated in the fall and winter have been drastically reduced. And is there a correlation between climate change and birds not migrating as far as they once did? And is that how does that impact the decrease in numbers and what is that going to look like? Those are great questions. So so for the first one, um, New York had had an incredible has had an incredible four or five month run of of new species uh, for for the county that have occurred um, that I guess it started in in the fall, uh, maybe maybe even in the late summer, um, with uh, first with that sort of uh, decaying hurricane that passed um, South Polar Skua, which is a a pelagic seabird, um, a wonderful photograph of one with the <laughs> George Washington Bridge in the background. Absolutely not something you would ever necessarily expect to see in New York. Uh, Swainson's hawk, a long overdue. Um, it, uh, it's a western, a western um, and really open country raptor that occurs in the eastern U.S. in in small numbers. There hadn't been one in in Manhattan per se. I'm, I'm sure one had passed at some point that we missed, but there was one in the fall. Um, let's see. Uh, you all recently heard about the the snowy owl, presumably that was present yesterday and drew a crowd of many, 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 many people. Um, that's not the first time one has been in New York. It's the first uh, time in over 120 years there's been one in Central Park, um, but uh, quite amazing. Um, you heard reference to greater white-fronted goose, uh, a Greenland greater white-fronted goose. That's a bird that um, we expect in very, very small numbers in the northeastern U.S. that had not been seen in Manhattan before and showed up on one of the ball fields uh, during the Christmas bird count um, associated with a flock of Canada geese. So there, there's been one thing that's always clear that no matter how much time you spend out birding, um, no matter how long you've been birding, there is almost always something new to find. And so being observant and going out continually, there's always the chance of finding something unique and interesting, uh, no matter what it is. So that's that's for the one question, uh, just an example. I'm happy to go into more detail by email or and answer any questions, by the way, by email or any time. Second question about migration changes and the numbers of birds. Um, we have seen some really dramatic changes uh, in, in bird behavior and in, in population level behaviors in the Northeastern US in particular over the last few decades um, that range from very large numbers of Canada geese uh, spending entire winters and becoming resident at this point uh, to turkey vultures now and black vultures uh, being a regular occurrence far into uh, cold areas where they did not previously occur in the winter. Um, and some of these changes are likely a function of uh, altered climate. Um, some of them are a function of human land use change. Uh, when it comes to geese, um, just uh, the, the notion of having open water, uh, having golf courses, having open, open areas, short grass where they can feed uh, in the winter um, has been a big part of this. Uh, turkey vultures and black vultures, some of that has to do with uh, changing patterns in the white-tailed deer population and such huge numbers of deer and roadkill deer that there is now an abundance of scavengeable food uh, throughout the winter. So some of it relates to climate change uh, for particular species. Some of it's human, uh, you know, sort of human habitat land use kinds of changes and, uh, and behavioral changes. Some of it's obviously both. Um, and then some of it, of course, has nothing to do with changes that are happening here, but have to do with changes that are happening in dramatically different parts of oh, shit. birds' life cycle. And birds oh. life cycle. Thank you. 
Um, okay, another question oh, we have damn. is Honestly. Um, for tomorrow, if, if, if we have, we have the so avid artists who want to head out tomorrow, is there anything that particular with the colder weather coming that they can be looking for? And along sort of the same line is if the weather does dramatically change from week to week, you know, maybe not here, but someone's saying in Atlanta, does that throw the birds off and confuse them? Yeah, so um, in terms of tomorrow and the next few days, we're about to get in, well, for those of you in the greater New York area or the bigger sort of, you know, the Northeast anyway, there is a massive cold air mass uh, arriving. And with that, and with freezing temperatures and any time uh, water bodies freeze, waterfowl are on the move. Um, I think perhaps the most dramatic uh, case of it was the miracle on the Hudson. That was, uh, if those of you remember, you know, a little over a decade ago, the U.S. air flight that hit, uh, you know, a flock of Canada geese. That happened uh, during one of these periods where there was a major cold snap um, and freezing conditions that pushed waterfowl south, basically what we call facultative uh, migration. So birds migrating when they need to, rather than uh, when they, uh, when uh, there's just some kind of obligate uh, pattern, very different sort of thing that happens. Um, so with waterfowl, this is something we see all the time. So in the next couple of days, if there's the level of freeze that we think is gonna happen farther north, all the water bodies that have common reganser and ringneck duck and things like that will start to freeze. And so northern Manhattan along the Hudson, Randall's Island in particular, it's a great place where common reganser often shows up when there's a freeze up north. So that's just I don't know. It's not Andrew just froze. I think I froze. Back, yeah, back. I there for a minute. Talking about freezing. <laughs> um, freezing before the, the cold arrives. Um, in any case, common reganser, uh, ringneck duck, a number of other species of waterfowl, those are on the list for what could be moving around locally. Now, when the snow comes, which in theory, the snow comes on Monday in maybe some great amount, uh, snow cover uh, and extensive snow cover causes other kinds of these facultative movements, in particular open country birds. So things like horned lark, uh, any American pipit, snow buntings, Lapland longspur, sparrows, birds that are foraging um, terrestrially often will move to wherever there's open ground. So often uh, when these incredible snows happen, uh, Central Park becomes just this magnet for white-throated sparrows and other things. I mean, just like numbers like you wouldn't believe <laughs> that are almost almost unimaginable um, to think of, you know, how many, how many small songbirds are still actually uh, persisting um, in these awful conditions. But in any case, open country birds and looking in places where there's still open country after a big snowfall during these kinds of periods where traditional migration, seasonal movements aren't really happening so much. We do see things like that. So that's the sort of thing to look for in the next couple of days. Waterfowl, open country birds, depending on how hard the freeze is and uh, how much snow cover there is. Thank you. We can just wrap up. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Just wrap up with this last question that um, if you could speak to the impact, if anything, on wind turbines and migratory birds. So the wind farms on the prairies in Iowa, you know, does that impact the bird migration or birds in general? Also a really good question. So um, we know that from the, the existing studies right now that structures like buildings and homes are responsible for probably three orders of magnitude more uh, bird deaths than wind turbines. Um, and the cats, uh, feral cats, outdoor cats, are responsible for another order of magnitude greater than that. Now that said, uh, birds do collide with wind turbines. Um, there are not a tremendously large number of them right now. So there is an issue there of uh, a source of mortality. I think the biggest issue with, with wind turbines, aside from that one, we wanna get away from fossil fuel. So anything we can do to do that is a good idea. You know, and the whole concept is a great idea. I think the, the thing about wind turbines is if they can be sighted in an appropriate way, and if they can be illuminated in ways that are as reduced as possible, 
that has been the thing that has minimized uh, the risk that they can pose to uh, migrating birds. The, the new frontier for wind turbines offshore, which is a place where we expect wind turbine, uh, that, that um, energy development is going to grow tremendously in the next couple of years. We're working pretty closely um, with a number of different people. There are quite a group of researchers involved trying to gather as much information as possible as what's going to happen with all those birds that are migrating over the water when they encounter these illuminated and active turbines. And so at least there's an understanding that there is an issue there. Um, and the magnitude of it, we don't know. But there's a good understanding that there are at least some really positive ways to mitigate and to take to, to make the whole uh, system of of wind and renewable as green as possible without doing you know as as much damage as they could to migrating birds. So it's certainly a catch twenty two of sorts, but the benefits so far outweigh the costs right now. Thankfully, that it's a it's an equation that uh, most people still feel very good about. I think the issue is going forward. As long as we're smart about the way we develop this infrastructure there should not be any problem. And the benefit to um, obviously from an energy perspective is gonna be potentially huge, but the benefit then as a, as a um, uh, sort of an indirect effect to no more fossil fuel, no more mountaintop mine extractions, you know, no more tar pits, et cetera, that's gonna have a huge beneficial effect on birds as well. So hopefully we're gonna be in a place where we can mitigate any of the hazards and get all of the possible green upside. Whether we can get there, I hope so. We're certainly pushing on the science to try to help. Um, in another few years, we'll be able to see how well we do. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure we could continue to go on, but <laughs> I will be sure, again, thank you both very, very much. And there's lots of thank yous coming in um, to get the resources and share the links and the videos with everyone tomorrow so that you're, everyone's up to date. And if you missed anything, you'll be able to grab it then. Are there any last words, Elizabeth or Andrew? Well, I think Andrew has promised that he'll take us all to the Empire State Building um, so we can see, uh, we can watch the migration with him. So. I will gladly go, gladly go. Well, we'll, we'll organize I'm something. In. We'll organize something. Okay. Yes, everybody's comfortable, absolutely. And I can also say that I see that there were a ton of questions in the, in the chat. Um, when we send information tomorrow, uh, I'm happy to include my email. Feel free to reach out with any questions or anything like that. And happy to talk at, at length, as you probably can tell about any of these things. Happy to answer questions or talk about the science, whatever it is, uh, no, no problem. I really appreciate the forum to, to discuss these things. No, thank you very much. It really thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good night, all.